بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone the kids in the back of the class are back <laughs> so last time our presentation against Farid we were making a very negative case we spent a lot of time dismantling Sunnism but not a lot of time building a positive case for Shiism. This time, however, we will be building our Shia narrative and we will demonstrate that our narrative is stronger and just as early. Now, I'd like to mention that what we will present here in this lecture is only a small fraction of what we have actually researched. And if you're interested, after this lecture, you can refer to the document in the description below. Now, without further ado, let's get into our lecture. So last time, as I mentioned, we brought forth a number of arguments against the Sunni narrative. In a nutshell, our argument was that Farid's claims to objectivity are not true. Farid is not objective. And we say this because Sahih chains are sahih only because all of the narrators in them agree with the Sunni narrative and the narrators are weakened because they and rejected because they conflict with the Sunni narrative. That is to say, Sunnis are presuming the truth of their narrative, which is certainly not objective. We of course mentioned other things like the least of the Sahaba, contradictions between the scholars of Rijal, but this was the main point that we wanted to deliver, that Farid weakens anything he does not like, and he takes the things that he likes. So in our last presentation, Farid responded, and he brought along Abdullah Mu'adaz with him. And his whole one and a half hour presentation can be summed up in about two sentences. We only need a few minutes to address his response. The first thing he mentioned is, Nasibism doesn't exist. And the second thing is that Sunnis take from innovators, and therefore the Sunni narrative is objective. And by the way, it should be noted that we also take from innovators and heretics as well. We take from Fatahis and Zaydis and Sunnis and Waqafis. We have an actual category in our hadith called Muwathaq, meaning thiqa, non-Shia, who we take from. So it's not the case that you can bring this charge against us. Rather, we also have taken this into account. But first, before we get into that, let's, let's appreciate Mr. Mu'ataz here a little bit more. Hadith critic by the name of uh, Al-Juzajani and who's accused of being a Nasibi and he's not simply because Nasibism doesn't exist but he's not a Nasibi but he's accused of it okay, okay. and you're, you're, you're gonna get me a, a lot of heats for saying that may Allah ma'alish let's no, get back okay. into this isn't the first time <laughs> yes Farid um, you're absolutely right you are gonna get a lot of heat for this because uh I'd really like to appreciate this next clip, but just a little more, you know? But you could hate him for a multitude of reasons. And even if you're wrong, it still not, it makes, doesn't make you a kafir. Because there's many reasons you could hate somebody, right? And it, and it goes yeah, down to yeah. that. People are people. MashaAllah. You can hate Imam Ali for any number of reasons. <laughs> Alright. We'll let that clip speak for itself. I wonder if he would say the same about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam. But let's let's take Farid's argument that Sunnis take hadiths from innovators and therefore Sunni narrative is objective a little more seriously. Okay. Let's see what he says here. And uh, he's asked about Adi bin bin Thabit, right? And that's who we were just discussing um, a few seconds ago. And Dar Do you know what Dar says about him? I do not recall. Okay, so he says ثقة إلا أنه كان رافضيا غاليا فيه. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow, wow. All right, so he says that Adi bin Thabit is trustworthy even though he was an extreme rafidi. 
It's really interesting. It's really interesting. So once again, this is a perfect example. Uh, a Daraqutni relying on someone who he sees as an extreme innovator. However, because he's truthful, he could simply, يعني, he could, he could he had to state it and he had to um, accept his report. So our point, of course, was that Sunnism is an objective because Shia narrators are weakened for having Shia beliefs and narrating Shia hadith. However, Farid responds by bringing a Shia, Adi bin Thabit, who is considered thiqa by Dar Qutni, as an counterexample to our claim. So this clearly defeats our point, no? Actually, this supports our claim even further and digs Farid into an even deeper hole. But before we get into how this makes things worse for Sunnis, let's examine a little further whether Farid himself even buys into this argument. Let's use Hadith al tayr al-Mashwi as an example to demonstrate Farid's inconsistencies here. Hadith al tayr says, The Prophet ﷺ had a bird, and he said, Ya Allah, send me your most loved creature to eat this bird with me. Abu Bakr went to the Prophet, but he did not let him in. Then Umar went in. But the Prophet did not let him in either. But when Ali السلام, went to him, he let him in. Clearly, this contradicts with the Sunni narrative. For example, when Ibn Umar says, While the Messenger of Allah was alive, we used to say Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman. But they did not conclude Ali, meaning Ali was not among the best of the Sahaba. However, the most beloved in the eyes of Allah has to be the best of the Sahaba. So hadith is al is problematic to the words of Ibn Umar and therefore problematic to the Sunni narrative. Now, despite this hadith being mutawadr, it has 33 chains, Farid attempts to weaken it. Farid weakens Abad bin Ya'qub in one of the chains on account of Ibn Hibban saying that he was a Shia who called to his innovation. Here is what Ibn Hibban says. He says, and there's no dispute between the Zahar Imams of Ahl al Hadith that if an excelling Saduq had a bid'ah in him, in this case he means being a Shia, and if he did not invite to it, then using his narrations as hujjah is jais, permissible. But if he did invite to his bid'ah, then his hujjah falls. Now it should be noted that Abad bin Ya'qub is being rejected by Ibn Hibban for calling to his innovation and reporting rejected narratives. Which means, he is reporting things that go against the Sunni orthodoxy. Essentially, if a Shia narrates Shia-leaning beliefs, then we can't take his narration. Clearly this is not objective. However, the irony is, Farid says, use, he uses Abad bin Ya'qub as an example of how Sunni Rajal scholars are objective in accepting Shia narrators. He says, this statement of Ibn Khuzayma is quoted as an example of the objectivity of hadith scholars who would relate and rely on hadiths from those they viewed as heretics. Very objective. Let's take a look at this screenshot here. Here, Ghadir786 is trying to strengthen a narrator, Ja'far bin Sulaiman, by quoting Ibn Hibban where he says, If an innovator did not call to his sect, then his hadith is accepted. However, Farid responds to this to weaken Ja'far bin Sulaiman by saying merely by transmitting the hadith, the narrator is calling to his sect and therefore he is rejected. So Farid is saying, this narrator disagrees with Sunnism, therefore it is rejected. Essentially, by Farid's own standards, he is not being objective. Anyway, let's return back to the point we made earlier that accepting Shia narrators as trustworthy causes a bigger problem for Sunnism. If they accept that Shia narrators are trustworthy, then you have to accept that what they narrated from the Imams is true as well. So if the narrators attribute Imami beliefs and Imami fiqh to the Imam, and they were trustworthy by Sunni standards, then Farid has to accept 
that this was correctly attributed to the Imam by Sunni standards. And if Imami beliefs and Imami fiqh were correctly attributed to the Imams, then that means that the Imams were saying this and they believed in these things. This means that they were undoubtedly Shia. However, the subject of our lecture today, Abdullah Biqai, he believes the exact opposite of this. He believes that the Shias were liars and fabricators. He believes that the beliefs and fiqh attributed to the Imams by the Shias are built on a web of lies and fabrications. Now, of course, this is a very extreme claim, and therefore the burden of proof is on him to substantiate this. As we say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. These two positions lead to an uncomfortable double bind for the Sunnis. If we take Farid's argument, then it follows that the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt are Shia, and therefore, by Sunni standards, they are heretics and innovators. However, if we take Biqai's argument, then he forfeits any claim to objectivity because he presupposes his own narrative. And what's worse is that he has to believe that the Shia community created an intricate conspiracy composed of rival sects who hated each other and yet still somehow managed to believe in all the same things about Imama. And this same logic that Biqai is using then can be applied to the non-Muslims who use, who, who use this logic to believe that the Prophet never existed. We clearly can't take both of these arguments because, for one, Farid wants to claim that Shias are reliable and Biqai wants to claim that they're liars. Both of these arguments lead to conclusions which undermine the Sunni orthodoxy. Sunnis must either accept Biqai's claim or Farid's claim, but not both. And this brings us to the goal of this presentation, to refute Biqai's claims that the Shias were liars upon the Ahl al-Bayt. Therefore, if, if our argument is true, then Shia narrators were trustworthy. And that means the Imams Ahl al-Bayt were Shia. And this means, now either a Sunni must accept the Shayu as the truth, or they must say that the Imams were heretics. So let's jump right into the evidence. Here, we have presented a few narrators that are considered thiqa by Sunnis. Already, this is sufficient to prove our claim. Even Ibn Taymiyyah says the majority of what the Shias have narrated about these Imams are not lies, but rather the majority is truthfulness. However, we'd like to focus in a little closer on one narrator in particular and leave the rest to be explained in the document. It is usually claimed that the Shias have invented a sort of victim complex about themselves and that they did not face persecution that there was no reason to do taqiyya and that this taqiyya was done to to hide their innovation and and their their deviancy however ja'far ibn ziyad al-ahmar is very interesting because he actually demonstrates the need for taqiyya among the shias tarikh baghdad a sunni source mentions about him it is mentioned that abu ja'far al-mansur heard that he spoke about imama he meaning ja'far ibn ziyad and that he had the beliefs of the Rawafid, which led to Jafar bin Ziyad's imprisonment along other Shias, and they were later released. So clearly, this demonstrates the need for taqiyya among the Shias. The next evidence we considered was Quranic Hadith. Now, it is typically said that the Shias needlessly insert the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt into the Quran, that they invented Hadith of Tahrif to argue for their points, and so on and so on and so forth. Here, what we will show is a hadith where Imam Baqir is claiming the superiority of his knowledge in Tafsir ibn Kathir. And then under the verse, And we do not send before you except men to whom we revealed our message. So ask the people of the message if you do not know. Ask the Ahl al dhikr right? So what does Ibn Kathir note under this section? He says, and similarly, Imam Baqir has said, we are Ahl al-Dhikr. Now, Ibn Kathir's interpretation of Imam Baqir saying, we are the people of Dhikr, is that Imam Baqir means the Ummah and not the Imams. However, can we prove 
that Imam Bakr is actually referring to himself instead of the Ummah? Yes, we can. Look at the narration of Ibn Kathir, what he notes for 51.1. Imam Ali says, any ayah of the Qur'an and any sunnah of the Prophet, you ask me about it and I will explain it to you. This proves that when the verse 16.43 says, ask the people of dhikr, that when Imam Baqir says, we are the people of dhikr, he is referring to himself and he believes in the superiority of his knowledge to that of the others. This proves that the Shias were not the one who concocted the idea that the Imams were superior in knowledge. No, rather this was recorded in Sahih narrations by Ibn Kathir himself. The Imams believed that they were superior in knowledge to the rest of the people. Now, as we have mentioned, it is claimed that the Shias have invented Tahrif in their narrations to support their views. But is this really true? Let's take a look at 424, the verse of Mut'ar. Now, of course, the Shias have narrated in Al-Kafi and Tafsir Al-Qummi that there is an extra clause in this verse that is not found in the Uthmanic copy of the Qur'an. Now, before everyone gets up in arms about this, this does not have to mean that there is literally a clause missing out of the verse of, out of the actual Qur'an. Rather, what we can say is we can believe that this is divinely revealed da'wil, that is, clarifications and explanations that are in an imaginary set of parentheses in this verse, but not actually recited. Anyways, in Al-Kafi, it says that there is a clause which says, إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ musamma," Meaning, to a specified time period. So if this is truly part of the Qur'an, whether by interpretation or actually in the former text itself, then this definitely means muta is halal. Now bear in mind, Muta was considered an identity marker between Sunnis and Shias. That is, believing Muta was halal was a sign of being a Shia during the time of Imam Baqir and Imam Sadiq. Yet, despite this, this reading of Ila Ajalim Musamma is found attributed to Ibn Abbas in Mustadrak al Hakim with a Sahih chain, along with multiple other chains of narration to Ibn Abbas. This demonstrates that this reading has not originated with the Shias. Now let us move on to our third evidence. The third evidence we considered was the fiqh of the Ahlul Bayt as found within Sunni sources. And for this we considered the case of whether the Ahlul Bayt believed we should wipe over our khufain, the leather socks. Now bear in mind, this example of the Khufain is only one case we are looking at. We've actually taken our hadith from a book called Fiqh Al-Al, which compiles thousands of narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt from Sunni sources, which match exactly with Shia Fiqh. When this overlap between the Fiqh of the Ahl al-Bayt in Sunni and Shia sources is this significant, it cannot simply be explained away by weakening chains. Ibn Khaldun himself admits the Ahlul Bayt invented their own school and had their own jurisprudence, fiqh. They based it on their dogma requiring abuse of the Sahaba and upon their stated opinion concerning the infallibility of the Imams and the inadmissibility of differences in their statements. And this is a quote from Muqaddimah of Ibn Khaldun. So the question here is, very simple. If the Shias were not lying about the fiqh of the Ahl al-Bayt, why would they lie about the aqidah of the Ahl al-Bayt either? This brings us to our example of wiping over the khufain. The reason we have chosen wiping over the khufain is because just as how muta is a sectarian marker for the Shia, wiping on the khufain was a sectarian marker for the Sunnis. So if the Imams rejected this practice, then they were clearly not Sunni. Here in Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba, narrated from ibn Abi Shayba, from Hatim bin Ismail, from Imam Ja'far, from his father Imam Baqir, from Imam Ali, who said the book preceded, i.e. abrogated the Khufain. The book preceded the Khufain. This means, in Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba, Imam Sadiq and Imam Baqir both believed you should not wipe upon the Khufain. 
let's take a closer look at this hadith. Starting with the Isnad. This hadith goes through Hatim bin Ismail. He is unanimously considered thiqa by the Sunnis. Unanimously. And Najashi lists him as an Ammi, a Sunni. So it cannot be said that Hatim is a Shia, first of all, and that he fabricated this hadith on the Imam. And secondly, there are no intermediates between Hatim and Ibn Abi Shaiba. So it cannot be said that there is a Shia in the middle who has invented this hadith and has attributed it to Hatim. Third, if we look at the footnote in Musannaf Ibn Abi Shaiba, the hadith is actually graded as Mursal. If we, we look at why, it says, because Imam Baqir did not meet Imam Ali. Now this is a point of confusion for the Sunnis. However, our hadith explain exactly what is going on. Imam Sadiq says in Al-Kafi, My hadith is the hadith of my father, which is the hadith of Imam Ali, which is the hadith of the Prophet. So this is not Mursal for us, but it's Mursal for the Sunnis. Fourth, the Imams have said something very interesting. They said there's no taqiyah in two things. Wine and wiping over the Khufain. This is found in Al-Kafi, by the way. And this again demonstrates how significant of a sectarian marker this was between Sunnis and Shias. Wiping over the Khufain, they never did taqiyah in this. Finally, let us consider what the Shia Rafada, quote-unquote, liars have narrated in Tahdib al-Ahkam. Imam Sadiq narrates that Imam Ali said, the book preceded the Khufain. This is the exact same wording with the exact same quote unquote irsal used in the Sahih hadith of Musaddaf ibn Abi Shaiba. Therefore, we have demonstrated that the Imams rejected Sunni orthodoxy. Now, before we move on, I would like to mention a very brief aside. We mentioned that Sunnis considered wiping over the socks as a matter of aqidah. Why is this? This is because they say that wiping over the socks is mutawatir, and therefore it cannot be denied. So if the Imams are denying wiping the khufain, then certainly they've made a mistake, no? Well, as we mentioned, the Imams have said that this ruling was abrogated, and therefore that it no longer applies. This has happened actually with many rulings, in fact. Uh, for example, the Sunnis, they believe that muta was abrogated. So therefore, they must accept that fiqh in general can be abrogated. In fact, there is a narration in Tirmidhi where Sunnis believe Abu Huraira was confused by an abrogated ruling. According to the Sunnis, at one point, fire made things nudges, and it was later an abrogated ruling. Now in Tirmidhi, Abu Huraira says to Ibn Abbas, Wudu is required from whatever the fire has touched. And when Ibn Abbas objected to it, Abu Huraira doubled down, indicating that he believed that this ruling was the case. Now this is significant for a few reasons. Number one, it would be expected that if someone were so close to the Prophet, that they, and that they would have a strong knowledge of fiqh and hadith. Right? However, this narration demonstrates that Abu Huraira was weak in fiqh and hadith. Two, this exact phenomenon of the companions being confused by abrogated rulings was mentioned by the Imam in al kafi Someone came to the Imam wondering why Shia and Sunni fiqh differ. He said, were the Sahabas liars? So the Imam, uh, presumably referring to the ones not named as liars in other reports, said, they spoke the truth. So the man asked, so if you were both saying the truth, you, the Imam, and the Sahaba, then why are there differences between the Sunnis and the Shias? And the Imam finally responded, because one hadith would abrogate another hadith. This confusion mentioned by the Imam is demonstrated in this hadith of Abu Huraira. So returning to the point, the Imams have not made a mistake here. Fiqh can be abrogated, and the Imams knew that wiping on the Khufain was abrogated. And this demonstrates the strength of our hadith, where our hadith begin to shine. We, unlike the Sunnis, do not have confusion 
between what is abrogating and what was abrogated. Rather, what we have received from the Imams is the final rulings of Islam, what is confirmed and certain and final. Finally, we considered other miscellaneous hadiths. So, for example, here we'd like to focus in on the narration of the earth is not without a hujjah. Now here, Farid lists this hadith as an extremist Shia narration of Abad bin Ya'qub. Certainly, a belief that the world would fall apart were it not for a prophet or an imam sounds like a hadith that Shias would fabricate to justify the belief of imama. However, Ibn Kathir and Abdul Bar say that this hadith of the earth is not without a hujjah is actually famous, mashhur. And it does not even need a chain. It is an accepted hadith. This means even apparently extremist quote-unquote Shia narrations have actually backing in Sunni hadiths. Now, the last evidence we considered were heresiographical evidences. That's a big word. What does it mean? It means the development of different sects and schools. So what does Najm Haider have to say on this? Here in Origins of the Shia, Najm Haider analyzed thousands of different chains of narrations from Sunnis, Shias, and Zaydis on different fiqhi issues. What he found was that while initially the three communities, the Sunnis, the Zaydis, and the Shias intermingled and shared many narrators, sometime later during the second century Hijri, the Shia community became independent and no longer shared any narrators with the Sunnis and the Zaydis. And he takes this as evidence that the Shias became their own community separate from the Sunnis and the Zaydis. Now let's consider the following narration from Al-Kafi, where it is said, The Shia before Imam Baqir did not know their haram and halal. And by the way, um, as we mentioned with the Abu Huraira example, neither did the Sunnis. But the quote continues, But Imam Baqir opened up their knowledge and people began to realize that they needed him very much, while before they would ask other people for what they needed. The timing of the 2nd century Hijri matches up exactly with the tenure of Imam Baqir and the beginning of the tenure of Imam Sadiq exactly when this hadith says that the Shias grew independent as a community. Finally, let's recap what we've talked about so far. To prove that the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt were Shia and that their narrators were trustworthy, we looked at the following evidences. Number one was Shia narrators who were considered trustworthy by the Sunnis. Number two, Quranic hadith that supported Shia beliefs and fiqh. Number three, explicitly Shia-leaning fiqh found in Sunni sources attributed to the Imams. Number four, quote-unquote extremist Shia beliefs found with reliable chains in Sunni sources. And finally, number five, evidence from the development of Sunni, Shia, and Zaydi Isnads. With all of these evidences considered, we can say that we have sufficiently proven our point. Furthermore, it should be noted, our argument cannot simply be explained away by playing isnad games and weakening hadiths. Because this level of overlap in both fiqh and aqidah is not just a mere coincidence. Bear in mind, what we have selected in this presentation is only a fraction of what we have written in our document. And the document is only a fraction of the real level of overlap between what was narrated from the Imams in Sunni sources and in Shia sources. To believe that this level of overlap can be explained by coincidence is to suggest that the whole of the Shia community collected in on an intricate lie. Waqifi and Qat'i Shias fought over thousands of dirhams of Khums debating whether to give Khums the one false Imam or another false Imam. The sons of the Imam Sadiq claiming a false belief in Imama, pretending to succeed their false Imam of a father. Such large-scale Shia infighting cannot be the product of a few quote-unquote pesky Kufin liars. 
it's clear that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were Shia. So with that being said, we would like to remind everyone of the Hadith of Thaqalain. O oh people, indeed I have left among you that which if you hold fast to, you shall not go astray. The Qur'an and my Ahlul Bayt. And with that, we leave the Sunnis with two options. Do you call the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt heretic and innovator Shias? Or do you accept the Shayu as the truth? Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Thank you very much for listening.